So have you ever pondered your existence? Anybody ever done that before? Uh, I remember growing up, a lot of times in high school, like basically every day, I would lay awake at night and I would think about these things, okay? I'm going to let you inside my head. Some of you are scared. Um, I, w- I would start to think, okay, I'm going to be here for maybe, you know, some decades, maybe, hopefully, on this blue ball that's spinning on an axis, whirling around the sun. Maybe I'll get to be on this journey around the sun a number of times and thinking about, like, oh, you know, all the things that I might be able to do. And then I would start thinking about, okay, well, that's, that's cool. What about like the past, and I started thinking about all the things that we learned in school, or the things that we hear that had happened, but none of us were there, but we all believe it happened because of people's testimonies, and I think about all the, the pain, the joy, the sorrow, all the things that have happened in human existence, and I would zoom out a little bit, and I'd start thinking about the beginning of all this thing. Like, what was that like? What, 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 what made it start? Who pressed play, you know? And I'd think, well, what about before then? Before all of this. And I'd be like, okay, I don't know. Head hurts a little bit. And then I'd start going to the future and think, okay, maybe I'll be able to be here, you know, 80, 90 years, I don't know, be able to do some stuff, and then I die. And then what? Like, it's just, it's just nothingness? It's like, we're just here, and then, and then bam, and we, we just cease to exist? Yeah, I didn't grow up in a Christian home. I didn't have any framework for heaven. It's like, is that what it is? And I, I get frustrated at that, that thought because it's like, it doesn't make sense. Why would we even be here if it was just like, poof, and we're done? Have you ever pondered your existence? You see, there's, there's a, a co-author of a book named Jesus Among Secular Gods. His name is Vince Vitale. And he uh, identified four crucial questions that we as human beings seem to go back to in life. And they are this, where, where did I come from? We ask that question, why am I here? How should I live? Where am I headed? What, what's the future hold? And I would argue that all religions, all belief systems, all frameworks, worldviews, interact with those four questions. Some of, some of religions may emphasize certain questions more than others, but needless to say, I think all religions, all belief systems, all of these things interact with those four questions because we as human beings... I think from the beginning of our existence have asked those questions. We've tried to reconcile our existence. Why am I here? What's the point? What's gonna happen? And that kind of brings us to the the false news spiritual statement of the day. And that is this. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. It doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. Like, it's all good. You, this sounds kind of nice, right? Like, you believe what you believe. I'll believe what I believe. We don't have to argue about it. It's just all good, you know? Like, you hang out over there. I'll hang out over here. We don't have to talk about it. Actually, we can even be together because we don't even need to talk about it because it doesn't matter anyway as long as we're sincere. But if you, you know, if, uh, sincerity is the big thing, so don't you doubt unless you're sincere about the doubt. Think about it. So I kind of, you know, just thinking about this statement, started asking myself the question, like, who decided that sincerity is the highest virtue of life? Like, who decided that when we start thinking of the divine or the lack thereof or anything beyond us, who decided that sincerity was the chief virtue when it comes to the subject? Like, you know, it's, it's all good. You, you believe in eternity with Jesus, I'll believe in reincarnation. I'll believe that one day I'll get it right, and I'll be a lion. It'll be awesome. <laughs> you know, you, you believe in nirvana, I'll believe in Islamic paradise. It's all good, whatever. You believe in hell, I'll believe in nothingness after our existence. As long as you're sincere about your beliefs, it's all good. But here's my hunch, and of course you know my cards, because I'm a pastor, Jesus follower, uh, the, the series is called False News, so you know where I'm going to land on this statement on whether or not I believe it to be true. But here's my hunch, and let me just say this. You can believe wrongly, but sincerely, but all that makes you is sincerely wrong. That's good. <laughs> Tweet that. <laughs> But really, does it matter what we believe? I mean, really, because it's all just in our heads. Does it really matter? It doesn't impact anything. It's just in my head, it's your head. It's just thoughts, belief. What does it matter? Does it matter? 
I think when we start asking this question, I think we need to ask a different question. And that is this. What do you do with Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? We can talk about all these other dynamics, but the thing that begs an answer is what do you do with Jesus? Because no historian's gonna deny that he existed. He existed. And the claims that he had made, here's what I know about Jesus. What I know about him and his life and what I know about the testimony about his life and all the things that we know that he did is I know that he wouldn't drive with that statement. He wouldn't be like, oh, I'm gonna tweet that, you know, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere. He wouldn't have that on his bumper sticker. He wouldn't bring that up over dinner. Like, hey, here, you know, I'm Jesus. I'm gonna give you a little wisdom nugget. Uh, here, it doesn't matter what you believe as long as you're sincere, just make sure you're sincere. I don't think he would be good with it. I just don't. And so we have to ask the question, what do you do with Jesus? Because he made some pretty audacious, crazy claims about not only what he would do, but who he is. And just to kind of bring us all kind of up to speed together, uh, in the Bible, there's these first four books of the New Testament, and they are by the names of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And the reason why they have those names is because these were four people who wrote about Jesus' life. Matthew was a tax collector. He was cheating people out of their money, and Jesus went up to them and said, hey, follow me, follow me. And he's decided to follow Jesus, and then after Jesus' life and his resurrection and all these things that we'll get into, he decided to write it all down. And then that's what we know as the gospel according to Matthew. And then Mark, he was a ministry partner of the apostle Peter, so he was going around, spending time with Peter and learning about him, and he decided to write down a biography of Jesus as well. So you got Matthew, Mark, then you got Luke, and he was a physician, like a doctor, and he was hanging out with the Apostle Paul on all of his ministry, uh, on all of his mission uh, field kind of journeys and planting churches and all this and that. And Luke really kind of took a journalistic approach and interviewed eyewitnesses to Jesus' life, and he compiled it into what we know as the gospel according to Luke. And then John, we get to John, and John is unique. John calls himself Jesus' beloved disciple. Like he was besties with Jesus. And he, was, that, he didn't even refer to himself as John. He just called himself like Jesus' bestie. Like, hey, you know, me and him, we're tight. And he decided to write down uh, his testimony, his gospel biography of Jesus. And he tells us kind of why he decided to do it in verse 31 of chapter 20 in his book, John. That's what he said. But these, like all the things I've written, these are written so that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. You see, from the very beginning of the people who spent time with Jesus, learned from Jesus, were taught by Jesus, did ministry with Jesus, and then were impacted by Jesus' life, belief has been of paramount importance. That's the testimony that we see in scripture, that belief is important. And so the question is, what do you do with Jesus? Because if Jesus was all a sham, then it doesn't matter. But if it was all true, then it matters. It matters. It has eternal, or eternity in the grasp. See, I want to dive into some claims that Jesus made about himself and what Jesus' uh, followers, people around Jesus, made claims about him. And we're just kind of maybe see whether or not belief actually matters. If there's something more to it than just something in our head. So John 1 so we're going to start in John, John chapter 1, so we'll be there for a minute. John 1, 1 says this. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. It goes down to verse 14. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. We observed his glory. The glory is the one and only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. There's so much in that, but I want to unpack just two things First off, if you were a Jew reading this, just, you know, put on your good first century Jew hat right now. Like, you're, that's who you are right now. If you were reading this, you would be reminded of something very specific in the book of Exodus. You would have been reminded of what God did for the Israelites, bringing them out of slavery in Egypt and into the, the desert, into this barren place. And what he said was, build this tabernacle, this tent. And in that tent, is gonna be my presence. I'm gonna dwell among you. I'm gonna lead you by day, lead you by night. There's gonna be a pillar of cloud by day, a pillar of fire by night, and I'm gonna be with you. And when John started saying Jesus became flesh, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, he's 
bringing up this picture that Jesus is God coming down with us to dwell among us in a very fleshly, real person kind of way. The, the, the thing that, that this shows me is that in, in comparison to all the religions in the world, where the predominant message, when you boil it all down to its essence, is you got to keep trying, you, you'll be reincarnated however many times, eternity times, before you get it right, and you can maybe step into nirvana, or, or maybe God will have mercy for you if you're following Islam. All the different things, the, 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 the chief kind of message is climb the moral do-good ladder, and if you do good enough, maybe you could reach God. Maybe you could reach this bliss and you could escape from suffering in this world. But what Jesus says is, no, no, no. You, I'm not going to ask you to climb to me because I know you can't do it. But I care about you enough. I love you enough that I'm going to come down to be with you. And all your messes and all your, and all your failures and all of your mess, I'm going to come and be with you because I'm the only one who can clean you up. And so that's the message that Jesus has for us that is completely different than all the rest of the religions in the world. Is I'm coming to be with you. I'm not expecting you to come to me because you can't do it. The whole reason me coming to you is because you messed this relationship up, but I'm coming to fix it. And so in Jesus, we see a different message. And he goes on, there's more, starting uh, verse 29. John chapter 1, the next day John, which John is, uh, this is different John than the, the writer John, but John is Jesus' cousin, John the Baptist, okay? So imagine your cousin saying this about you. The next day John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, here is the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. None of y'all cousins said that about you. <laughs> I mean, right? Verse 34 goes on, I have seen and testified that this is the Son of God. Verse 49 Somebody else, Rabbi Nathaniel replied, you are the son of God, you are the king of Israel. You are the king of Israel. So for the Jews, like the lamb of God, that was significant imagery because what they would have to do is they would account for their sin by sacrificing an animal and that would hopefully kind of make them somewhat right with God. But they would have to keep doing it and keep doing it and keep doing it because it kept messing up and messing up and messing up. And there's all these imageries with the Passover and stuff. You can read about it in the book of Exodus. But the, the, the message is this, basically, that, that Jesus became the Lamb of God who can cover you with his, with his blood, cover all of your sins one time forever for eternity so that you might have salvation in his name. He's the Lamb that came to be the sacrifice that none of us could have so that we could be made right with God. And then it's, it's really interesting when you look at the, the kind of meaning of son of God. Most of us think son of God and we just think, okay, Jesus is the son of God. He's second member of the Trinity. But one of the interesting things about uh, this time is when they called the son of God, a lot of times they were referring to a king. Like you could see scripture referring to David as like the son of God, kind of like because he, he's the king. And for, for most of them in those days when they thought of the Messiah, the son of God, the king, they were thinking of someone who would come and rule and reign and bring Israel back to prominence on the world stage so that they could be a people again, not under Roman rule, but in a very earthly political way, be back to dominance. And so when they say, hey, you're the king of Israel, you're the son of God, like this, we're hoping that you're going to be the person that we've been desiring to bring us back to a place that we could thrive as a nation. But as we'll see, Jesus had a different picture of what that meant. Yes, he was the king, but his kingdom was different than what they were thinking. Uh, just the question, what do you do with Jesus? Here's some things that he said about himself. To know him is to know God. To see him is to see God. To believe in him is to believe in God. To receive him is to receive God. To hate him is to hate God. To honor him is to honor God. Now, for most of us, that probably sounds like, oh yeah, I mean, I read that. That's, that's true. That's what Jesus said about himself. But sometimes we lose the effect of what this could have meant in that moment. I mean, just imagine your neighbor, the neighbor you love, right, at your house next to you, came out on their lawn, and they had a loudspeaker, 
and early in the morning, they woke you up and announced, hey, to know me is to know God. To see me is to see God start saying all these things about himself. Who would you call? Who would you call? The police? Because they're crazy, right? If I started saying, hey, you know, you just see me and see God, you would think I'm nuts, right? Yes. You better think I'm nuts, because I would be. But here's the thing. Jesus said all these things, and up till now, like, we could just, just parse this off as hogwash, as fantasy, as mythology, like this is just made up about this guy. He was very charismatic. He had a lot of followers. We just want to make some things up about him. But I want us to consider, because I want to consider his defining moment, the resurrection, because without the resurrection, all of it is fantasy. All of it is hogwash. All of it is mythology. Because without the resurrection, none of us have a faith in Jesus that worth is, means anything. If he didn't rise from the dead, what we're doing right now is a waste of time. If he didn't 2,000 years ago rise from the grave, then what we're doing right now, the things that you pray, the things that you do, reading your Bible, it means nothing. But if it is true, if he really did rise from the dead, then that means the question, what do you do with Jesus, is of eternal importance on how you answer that. So I want to just consider a little bit of what the testimony is about Jesus' resurrection, his defining moment. Because if he really did rise from the dead, it absolutely matters what you believe. So according to the most analyzed, most scrutinized, most proven to be reliable document of history, no, nothing, no document has been more scrutinized than the Gospels of Jesus, um, this is the testimony that is what happened. Basically, the Jewish leaders schemed against Jesus because he was disrupting their influence and their stronghold in the Jewish hierarchy. Jesus was teaching a subversive message that was going to end up having him as king and them as Jewish leaders as less prominent and less influence. And so what they did was they schemed together, they got this plan together, uh, con like basically turned Judas, one of Jesus' disciples, against him, and they schemed a way to arrest him in the dead of night, and they were going to put him on trial and hopefully get rid of him. And so they arrest him, the, the Jews take him to the Sanhedrin, this, uh, this kind of council of the religious leaders of the day, and they put a, b a bunch of charges against him. He basically says nothing. And they're thinking to themselves, we want to get rid of this guy, but we really can't because we're under Roman rule. And anything like law-abiding things uh, as far as punishment was going to have to be carried out by the Romans. And so they went to Pontius Pilate, the Roman governor of, of Judea. And they said they knew that Pontius Pilate, according to history, we know that basically he was having some hard times with the higher-ups at the moment. So he was a little bit on, you know, eggshells when, when he's kind of evaluating his job as the Roman governor. And so they say, hey, you should know that this crazy Jewish rabbi guy, um, he's claiming to be king. He's a problem. You probably should do something about it. You probably should deal with him. And so Pontius Pilate has him brought to him, and he's in a back room, and Pontius Pilate simply asks, are you the king of the Jews? And basically Pontius Pilate determined that, hey, Jesus is not really a criminal. Like, I don't know why these people are upset. But he goes out, and basically one time a year they would release a prisoner, and they would let him go. And so Jesus, Pontius Pilate put, to put up Barabbas, this murderer, and Jesus on this side, and asked the crowd, who do you want? Who do you want? You want Barabbas, murderer, or do you want Jesus? The person just seven days ago, you were praising as he entered into Jerusalem on a donkey. Who do you want? And the crowds chose Barabbas. And Jesus was left to be flogged. And when I say flogged, that doesn't really mean much for us because, you know, it just doesn't happen much today that we know of, at least here. But I asked a doctor, in fact, I read it in a book, I didn't ask him, but he told me in a book, uh, he said this about flogging, just to give us a little picture. The back would be so shredded that part of the spine was sometimes exposed by the deep, deep cuts. The whippings would have gone all the way
from the shoulders down to the back, the buttocks, and the back of the legs. It was just terrible. So Jesus gets flogged, and then the, the Roman guards decide to say, it's time to take him up to Calvary and have him crucified. So Jesus, bloodied and beaten, takes the horizontal beam on the cross, and he's carrying it. He's struggling. He needs some help getting it up there. When he got, got up to Calvary, they took spikes, not just nails, spikes, and into his wrist in between the two main bones in your forearm and put that on that horizontal beam, did the same thing to the other side and put his feet together and drilled a spike into his feet. And he hung there, dying a slow death by suffocation and exhaustion because in order for him to be able to breathe, he would have to push himself up on the spike to be able to take a breath and let it back down to let it out. And right before he gave his last breath, he declared a phrase that many Christians know and uh, hold very closely. He said, it is finished. And he breathed his last breath and he got stabbed by a Roman guard just to make sure he was dead. And then they took his body down and Joseph of Arimathea basically allowed uh, Jesus' uh, disciples and all of them to borrow his tomb to put Jesus in. And so Jesus, Friday ends, he's dead. In the borrowed tomb, there's a big stone, kind of circular stone rolled in front of the tomb. Roman guards are standing guard in front of the tomb. And Friday ends, Saturday comes and goes. The disciples are hiding because they're afraid for their lives because their leader, the person they thought was gonna be the king, is now dead. And they were worried that they might have some kind of repercussions too, so they were hiding. Saturday comes and goes, and then Sunday morning came, and the ladies decided to anoint Jesus' body with oil as a sign of honor, and so they decided to go down to where the tomb was, and as they got around the corner and saw the tomb, the tomb was open and empty. And they ran and told the apostles the news, and later, throughout 40 days, Jesus appeared to all of the apostles and to over 500 men and women, even at one time. And then he ascended into heaven and the apostles started to preach a message. So they went from hiding to now proclaiming this very message in Acts 3.15. You killed the source of life whom God raised from the dead. We are witnesses of this. We are witnesses of this. This isn't something we just believe. This isn't a story we made up. This is something we've seen to be true with our very own eyes. And I just have to think, like there's theories out there, people who don't believe the resurrection actually happened, theories out there that, that say that, you know, it was all made up. You know, like he died, yeah, but the whole empty tomb thing and, you know, basically what happened was the, the apostles decided to uh, come up with the greatest hoax in history and they managed to uh, not only get themselves out of hiding, but they went and they stole Jesus' body. They were able to hide it for centuries upon centuries. And then they, they not only did that, but they convinced thousands of people that this dead rabbi had in fact ro risen from the grave and was the promised savior of the world. Not only did they do that, but then they started preaching and teaching the gospel of Jesus, according to this dead guy, allegedly, and it spread throughout the known world. And you're telling me that 11 unschooled ordinary men were able to come up with the greatest hoax in history and keep it a secret, and then not only that, but they had nothing to gain to make it up. What did they have to gain? Prominence? Power? They gained none of that. In fact, their, their lives didn't turn out rosy and sunshine. It was, in fact, the complete opposite. They were burned at the stake, crucified, beaten, flogged, exiled. It didn't work out. And all for what? A made-up story? Surely not. But for something they knew to be true? Precisely. 
This isn't something that they just made up. No, their actions show it to be true. You see, for the apostles, this wasn't a thing in the realm of belief. It was in a thing in the realm of 100% knowing it to be true because they saw him with their very own eyes. You see, Christianity, unlike other religions, is founded upon a completely falsifiable claim. You can, tr- you can prove it to be false. All the people needed was a body. That's it. An arm. They just needed a body. That's all. You see, <clears throat> Buddha said, look to the wisdom of my teaching for, like, credibility. Like, you know, I got it going on. I got some wisdom, divine wisdom. Muhammad said, look to the beauty and eloquence of the Quran. That's subjective. Jesus said, after three days, I will rise again. That's not up to opinion. It either happened or it didn't. See, Christianity is founded upon one of the most falsifiable claims in history. He called it. (laughs) My friends, I'm here to say that not only did Jesus claim to do it, but he called a shot and did it. He's up at the batter's box saying, it's going there. (laughs) And he hit it there. He really did rise from the dead, and he called it. So again, the question is, what do you do with Jesus? What do you do with Jesus? Because here's the truth. The fundamental foundation of the Christian faith is belief in and surrender to Jesus. Eternity hinges on this. In Jesus, we see God coming down to be among us, to clean up our messes, to enter into our stories, and to make it a different ending. In Jesus, we see the love of God on full display. We see Jesus coming in and saying, hey, I love you. All you who are weary and heavy burdened, come to me, and I will give you rest. You don't have to try and do better. I'm here because you couldn't, and I knew you wouldn't, but I'm here because I knew I loved you enough to sacrifice everything for you. And so in Jesus, we see the full display of the love of God right there. In Jesus, we see God establishing his rule and reign. He's the king that the Israelites said, no, we don't want you, God, as our king. We want, we want Saul, we want David, we want Solomon, we want all the other failures in the, in the lineage of the history of the Israelites. We want them, we want people to be our king just like the other nations. But in Jesus, we see God establishing, reestablishing his rule and reign among not just Israel, but among every people, tribe, tongue, and nation, everyone. So I'm going to be your king. And his command to us is simply this. Surrender and believe. Surrender and believe to the king of kings. Mark 1.15, Jesus was very clear when he came on the scene of history. He said, the time is fulfilled and the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. Jesus is the miracle working king. See, what I know about this room is that many of us are walking miracles. Like we were on a level where when people found out that we were going to church, their mouths hit the floor because you were just that bad. I was just that bad. Like what is this, a cult or something? They surely didn't let you in there. Is the building still up? God didn't smite you? For real? See, many of us, we were so broken and battered by life and failures and all the things that we did wrong that we said, surely, no, 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 I'm, I'm broken. I am no good to anybody, including myself. But then we met Jesus. Some of us, we've experienced abandonment by our friends and our family, and everything in our lives has shown us and told us that we are not worthy of anything. That, in fact, it'd be better if we were gone. But then we, then we met Jesus. And he showed us that, no, 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 we do matter because he says we do. Many of us, we were angry at God. Some things happened and we just thought of him as this dictator just making everything go wrong and then we met Jesus. Many of us, at the time, we didn't believe in God at all. But then we met Jesus. Some of us were religious legalists striving to keep the rules and keep in God's good graces 
by doing as good as we can, and then we met Jesus, who is more gracious than we ever could have imagined. See, what I have realized is what many of you have realized as well, and it's what the, what the disciples of Jesus realized, that they went, from, they went from hiding because they thought when Jesus marched up to Calvary, that was the march of defeat. When they heard the clang of those spikes going into his hands and into his feet, they thought that was the sound of defeat. When they saw him bloodied and bruised and naked on the cross, their king, their hope, they thought that was the appearance of defeat. But what they found out later, when they saw his resurrected body, was that that march up to Calvary was not the march of defeat, but it was the march of victory. When they heard the clanging, they could realize, they could go back and realize that that clang of him being nailed to the cross was not the sound of victory. It was, the sound, it was not the sound of defeat, but it was the sound of victory. When they saw him before them, they realized that those four questions we started with, those four questions we started with, that it does have an answer. And the answer to those questions is a person. And his name is Jesus. And maybe when they realized that he was dead and gone, that was just halftime because later he came out of the tomb and he was going down third quarter, fourth quarter, and he reigned victorious. See, the four questions, I think, find their answer in Jesus. Where did I come from? Well, I was created by Jesus. Why am I here? I was created for Jesus. How should I live? You can look to Jesus. You can depend on his Holy Spirit who was sent by him to change you and lead you and guide you. Where am I headed? To be with Jesus. This isn't a hope so destination. This is a guaranteed destination. We are returning to the relational perfection of the Garden of Eden before sin. When God was walking among Adam and Eve, hanging out with them, it was all good. It was all beautiful. It was all perfect. And that is where we're headed back to through him. God is making all things new, new heaven, new earth, new you for all of us to dwell together with him. Jesus says, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one, you are not the exception. No one can come to the Father except through me. His promise is guaranteed by his victory over sin and death. When he rose from the grave, God stamped guaranteed on his claim. He stamped guarantee on you that you can be confident in entering into the throne room of grace and being received. Just as he was raised from the dead, we too will be raised to new life. For even though we die, we will live forever with him. That is our hope. That is the truth of what Jesus told us he was gonna do. So today, if you've never surrendered to Jesus, if you've never considered Jesus, if you've never thought about the question, what do you do with Jesus? I want to give you an opportunity today to surrender to him and believe in him because this is what eternity, eternity hinges on. The fundamental foundation of the Christian faith is belief in and surrender to Jesus. Eternity hinges on this. So there will be people for the rest of the service over by the crosses who would love to talk to you and lead you toward that step, toward that surrender, toward that belief in Jesus. If you, if you don't know how to respond to God's grace, then I want you to go to those places right there and right there throughout the rest of the service and they would love to help you with that. For the rest of us, you're like, yeah, I, I, yep, preach, I agree. I want us to do something a little bit different. First of all, would you guys stand? Right now, what I would, would love for all of us to do and to consider doing is to put in our minds, to think about one person, one person in your life right now who you know doesn't know Jesus you know it hasn't surrendered to him if anything maybe Jesus is just kind of like ah oh, he's, he's over there yeah whatever I don't really care one person in your life who you know if they could meet Jesus if they could know what you know if they could experience what you've experienced their life would be changed let's just think about that person I want to give us some time right now to just simply lift that person their name up to our heavenly father and just ask him God would you please 
please speak to them. Please reveal yourself to them. Please draw them to you. Do whatever it takes in their life. Maybe they have to hit rock bottom for them to look up. I don't know. But if they would look up and then see you, then it would be worth it. For them to know what I know. To know what you know. So just right now, I want to give you some time to lift that person up to our Heavenly Father and just ask Him to maybe even use you in a situation where you could speak the good news of Jesus to them, that God does love them and cares for them. Let's do that.